This week on C-SPAN's Afterwards podcast, writer Marie Arana shares stories and little-known histories of the diverse Latino population of America, the fastest-growing minority in the U.S. She's interviewed by American University Center for Latin American and Latino Studies director Ernesto Castaneda. Since March 19, 1979, C-SPAN, a public service funded by the cable television industry, began giving you direct access to government in an innovative way by putting you, the viewer, into the rooms where politics is debated and policies are determined. C-SPAN began as a bold initiative. Now, 45 years later, we are essential for those wanting to see democracy at work without editing or commentary. With continued cable support, we've done this without a dime of government funding, maintaining our independence. As we mark 45 years, the business of media is rapidly changing, and now your support is crucial for our mission's future. Support our legacy of unfiltered access by donating today at cspan.org slash donate. Thank you. Today, we have uh, the privilege of being joined by uh, Maria Rana, the author of this new book, Latino Land. Um, Latinos, a portrait of America's largest and least understood minority. So it's a fantastic book that is just coming out with uh, Simon and Schuster, and we're gonna be discussing it today. It's a it's a thick book, find uh, full of uh, exciting stories, new information, uh, overviews of the different Latino populations that live in the United States of America. So we're not gonna be able to cover it all today, but I wanna uh, scratch the surface and ask some questions to the author about uh, this fascinating new book. So uh, first of all, congratulations, Marie, on, on this uh, great endeavor, this great accomplishment. I have enjoyed very much uh, reading the book. It's uh, very accessible, very easy to read, uh, um, hard to stop reading, uh, a page turner. So, so that by itself is a big accomplishment because it also uh, goes over a lot of history, demographics, uh, facts, definitions in a way that it's uh, very illuminating for, for scholars, students, and the general public. Thank so you so much. Question. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. It's such a pleasure to be in conversation with you. Thank you for doing this. Uh, my pleasure, Marie. Thank you so much. And so my first question is, you uh, explain very clearly in the book uh, the fact that uh, pilgrims um, came many, many decades before there were uh, other people in the in what is now the United States of America that we would call today uh, Latinos or Hispanics. Uh, so I wonder if, uh, for the benefit of our audience, you can talk a little bit more about this uh, history of, of the of the Latinos in, in this Latino land. Absolutely, Professor. You know, uh, I think so many um, Americans who are non-Latinos think that we are recent additions to, to this country, uh, which is absolutely uh, incorrect. The uh, Latino people have been, first of all, uh, the original uh, inhabitants of this country. The indigenous uh, Latinos, of course, were here long before uh, they were called Latinos. And um, the history goes all the way back uh, to really uh, also include the Spanish conquest, of course, because the, uh, Sp the Spaniards, the conquistadores, were in Florida in 1535, and they were um, act actually coming up in, in Mexico in, uh, at the turn of the century, from the uh, 16th to the 17th century. So there is a long tradition, um, many hundreds of years before uh, the pilgrims last landed on Pilg um, Plymouth Rock. So we have uh, a history that goes really back um, 500 years for, for Hispanic Americans. That means a combination of Spanish and uh, indigenous. And um, way before that, uh, with the tribes that inhabited uh, this continent before um, the uh, America was even an idea. Correct, and again, that's something that uh, we often forget uh, as a nation. Is something that, as you say, is rarely um, explained in textbooks and in schools. So one of the questions that that arises from 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 your work is why would you th what would you say that despite this long history of Hispanics being in 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 the in, in the USA. Why, uh, as you call it, why do Latinos remain unseen? You know, that's a puzzlement to me. It's the reason why uh, I wrote this book. Um, I have now for two decades 
been trying to explain the history of uh, Latinos, and I started with um, Latin American history because that's where we all come from. And um, it occurred to me that, you know, there are 64 million uh, Latinos, Hispanics in this country, Latinx, whatever you want to call us. Uh, there are 64 million of us, which is larger than uh, any Spanish-speaking country in this hemisphere except for Mexico. Um, it's, it's an extraordinary amount of people. And uh, yet, uh, our history is not taught in schools. Uh, there are very few general history textbooks or civil um, studies textbooks that explain who we are and explain that we were here. Um, long before the country was even formed. So that's been my mission for, for many years. And now uh, when my editor said, well, you've written uh, a lot about Latin America, how about the Latin America that is here? Uh, and I remember one uh, ambassador said to me, you know, this is um, a country within a country. Uh, and it has been here a very long time. And it's about time that it was explained and taught in the schools. There's, um, it's, it's odd, our invisibility. It's almost, um, uh, I think the editor of the New York Times during the 60s and the 70s once said, this was uh, Scotty Rustin, um, James Rustin, who said, and he was on the front of the Time Magazine saying it, um, everybody loves Latin Americans, everybody loves uh, Latinos, but nobody wants to read about them. And I'm trying to challenge that in this book. Um, the stories are amazing. The stories are very rich uh, and full of, of diversity in itself. So um, I'm hoping that finally we can get rid of Mr. Reston's judgment that nobody wants to read about us. Absolutely, and that's why your book is so important because it covers this, this, this gap, this uh, absence in the learning of our own history, uh, and it's important. Uh, let me just comment real quick that uh, this seems to be uh, a, an ailment that affects uh, U.S. Americans in general. Uh, I think the public in the U.S. is not a, his, his historian buffs in general. Buffs, uh, we have a lot of people watching C-SPAN that probably do so, and they're more likely reading biographies of ex-presidents or, as you say in the book, these great many histories of uh, biographies, generals, presidents, emperors, or uh, histories about battles and wars, but uh, less so the history of the people and, and much less so uh, ethnic histories, right? I don't, I don't think there's many popular books about the history of even Anglo-Saxons in the US right after the independence, but much less so um, Scandinavians, Poles, Irish, Italians, and, and the ethnic histories throughout the US. Much of that is lost or is, is it keeps a, a regional focus or it's worked on very narrowly by historians. So uh, again, your book has a historical comprehension that it has a lot of depth and is looking at a lot of uh, Latino groups throughout the United States. Uh, it's a great uh, remedy for, for, the, for this issue that we have. Thank you. Among the variety, among the diversity of the, of the Latino people that, that you discuss, uh, we have, uh, I, I love your, your discussion about the, the indigenous question, the indigenous identity. So I wonder if you can please tell uh, your audience a little bit about the importance of this um, uh, indigenous history among many contemporary U.S. Latinos. Absolutely. I think that um, uh, what isn't realized, I think there's a sense, you know, even with the manifest destiny, when, when Americans were told um, to take their families and go west and just, you know, um, put a stake in the ground and, and um, spread America and uh, spread America's borders, um, I didn't realize, and I think even um, as they were doing it, they didn't realize that they were moving into uh, a land that already belonged to the Spanish colonial system. Uh, the indigenous, of, of course, who inhabited that whole section, and we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, territory that begins in Mexico and goes all the way up to Wyoming and Colorado, uh, and then west to east from, uh, from, from California all the way to Kansas. And um, that land belonged by conquest to, um, to the Spanish. And so that was an invasion of, of, of sorts. And the invasion was to a 
tremendously diverse group of indigenous people, um, people who belong to the Nahua, the Mayans, the, and then the, the, um, even the, uh, the Apache, who were Spanish-speaking, the Comanche also. Um, so we have uh, this um, tremendously rich culture of indigeneity. Uh, and then this tremendous culture that had begun in the 1500s when Cortes came to Mexico and conquered Mexico of the mestizo population, which in itself was uh, carried on the great uh, indigenous traditions of cultivating the land, of being agronomists, astronomers. I mean, there, were, there was a very rich culture um, before uh, the Spanish conquest and certainly, certainly before Manifest Destiny spread America all the way to the West Coast. That is correct. So that's a, a, a long history, uh, and you're right, part of the history is a history of, of uh, imperial expansion, of war, of, of taking over uh, territory. And again, that's something that you explain really well. You also dwell into the relationship with Spain and then the relationship with Puerto Rico, uh, Central America, and everything that is also has to do with with uh, interventions abroad and, and international relations. Um, you uh, mentioned in the book, and you just mentioned a minute ago, the 64 million or plus uh, people with that, that, that can trace back their their origins to Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, and you say that very interestingly, that uh, that is this, the second largest Spanish speaking population is uh, in the United States. But as you also say correctly, not all Latinos today speak Spanish. That's and cool. also this, this nation within a nation of Latinos, it's, um, it's so uh, demographically in terms of numbers, uh, but it is not. So I wonder if, if we can talk a little bit more about how the 64 million are so perfectly uh, enmeshed into American culture, how they are in all different uh, parts of the United States and how they are so integrated, uh, marrying uh, other people from other backgrounds, that they uh, can remain invisible, that they can, uh, um, they are not claiming for independence, right? They are not claiming for, for succession, the opposite. They are kind of the uber Americans. So I wonder if you can talk about that other side of the 64 million as a, as a, as a soft part of the US and talk about their, 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 their belonging, their embeddedness into the US society. Absolutely, absolutely, Professor. You know, um, I think part of the reason why um, the cohesion of Latinos um, has been so slow to actually happen is because we, the, the, the immigrants who have come here, of course the Mexicans who have lived on that land for generations all the way back to uh, before the conquest even, um, who've stayed in this side of the border, uh, have been here uh, for time immemorial. But for the immigrants who came, there is this uh, sense that you are a, a Boricua, a Puerto Rican, or you are, a, like me, a Peruvian American, or you know, a Colombian American, or a Panamanian American. Um, and then you learn when you come here as an immigrant that you are part of this body of, of Latinos and you're called a Latino, you're called a Hispanic. It's for the first time that anybody realizes that they are um, part of this, this larger group. Um, uh, and the groups, of course, that come are very, very different and they uh, inhabit different parts of the country. Uh, the Cubans, of course, are in the southeast, in, mainly in Florida, very much uh, a presence in Miami. Uh, and the, the Puerto Ricans as well are, are in Florida, but the Puerto Ricans are in New York and New Jersey and all the way up to, to um, Maine and New Hampshire. And uh, the, Dominican, uh, uh, the Dominicans as well, you know, the, the northeast is populated really with uh, Dominicans and Puerto Ricans and smatterings of everybody else because now the population is moving around depending on where the work is. So you have the Midwest finally um, in Chicago, there's a very big body of, of Mexican Americans who have come up uh, to work in the uh, different industries. And then of course the Mexicans who are 37 million 
of the 64 million is a great preponderance of, of Mexican Americans in this country and with a long history and a long sense of, of, of belonging really to the land, to the territory. Um, and all of these, we have a new wave of, of um, Salvadorans from El Salvador, from the whole Northern Triangle, from Honduras and, and uh, from Nicaragua. Uh, who have uh, come up since the 1970s. And so they're very, uh, very much a different group with different um, traditions and habits and rituals and, and different, different ethnic makeup. But, um, and not all of us necessarily uh, know one another. I mean, I, uh, you know, there, I have friends who are Mexican Americans who have never traveled east and have never really been in a, in a Dominican um, uh, context, really. Uh, so, so it's it it's hard sometimes to feel like you belong to any group that is outside your own. However, um, and and Juno Diaz, the the um, novelist, uh, Pulitzer Prize winning novelist, who is a Dominican, said, "You criticize any one of us, and we all are Latinos, and we all sort of coagulate and defend." Um, the tribe. Yes, uh, also in your book you talk about the people with no name. And you have a couple of, uh, of beautiful quotes uh, illustrating this. And, um, and and this eternal question, right, about what to be called, whether uh, Hispanic, as Nixon uh, did uh, to the Census Bureau, an imposition of a label that caught up and is still very vibrant in Texas and other parts of the of the country. Uh, Latinos, which is, as you say, relevant to the uh, Latin American idea that the French had to take control uh, colonially uh, of the, the, yeah, to, to conquer some of the land that the Spanish had left uh, or had become independent. Uh, so then how that became also popular in the US and then the, the more recent attempt to use Latinx to, um, to, to include LGBTQ plus people and trans individuals uh, and how with the population, uh, Latinos themselves that hasn't necessarily really caught up. So uh, I guess it would be useful uh, to to accept that even even for us Latinos, uh, we is confusing and it's, it's it's hard for many people in the audience may be asking us to tell them what is the right way to call somebody. And I think it's probably uh, important for us to say that that it depends on the context and the personal preference. That there's not one right quite right answer, but still there's something that brings us together and and we are grouped together. And and as you said, we an attack against one. Sometimes it's felt like like an attack uh, to others because of this categorization from outside. So so I wonder if you can talk, uh, Maria, a little bit about this idea of the of the no name and this kind of shifting identity that that um, as your title uses, uh, Latinos have have uh, gone through to the different decades? It is an issue. It's a, it's, it's a problem for us. I think, you know, um, there, is, uh, there is the Hispanic Heritage Foundation, which did, does great work nationally for um, Hispanics and Latinos and Latinx, whatever you want to call us. Um, and it has used that name proudly. And then there's the LULAC, which is the, um, the League of uh, Latin American. Uh, so it's very, very clearly identifying by the Latin part. Um, the, you know, we've tried to, to categorize it by saying, well, in the West Coast or in the East Coast, but it ends up being really um, the media using Latino more than anybody else, uh, than any other term. Um, Hispanic used by f for generations now, um, for a, a very long time. And, uh, and Latinx very recently, and only 2%, and many of, of, of the Latinos um, don't like the term Latinx. So, I mean, it sounds, it, even though it is a more inclusive term, as you say, um, and it is an effort by the part of, I think, mostly the intelligentsia of this country who are trying to be more inclusive. But, um, but it is a problem for us because you, what do you call yourself? Most people end up saying, well, I'm a Peruvian American or I'm a Mexican American. Um, and that seems to be a solution for many. And, uh, um, but in, in the greater sense, when you talk about this body that people are now seeing as an electorate as uh, a group that's going to vote in a certain direction. I think that, you know, that's an impossible dream. Um, but uh, the name, the naming business has always been an issue for us. 
that 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 is correct. Uh, if uh, let me add my two cents by saying that in some of my work I say that to avoid the gendered or Latino Latina that goes back to the Spanish gendered uh, language, which again is not unique to Spanish, but uh, to make it more gender inclusive, one could go back to this um, English word of Latin Latin people as an adjective rather than than claiming the uh, the name of, of, of a course. people. But still, that that hasn't caught up, and that's. Uh, not not wrong, but um, so so yeah. It's um, it, it's a shortcut for a creation of an identity that, as you say in the book, it was something maybe that uh, Simón Bolívar, the great uh, South American um, fighter for independence, had this idea of creating a larger Latin American nation that will in, 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 in encompass a lot of the independent countries in the global in the in, in the south of, of the continent or throughout the region that would uh bring all the the descendants of the of the spanish and and, uh, and the conquistadores and the indigenous people in in the in the latin american part of, of the continent and that has not been a reality but as you will say in the book and i think this is correct um this uh dream of uh, of um mixing of these different people from from spanish colonial uh, and indigenous origins happening in the u.s with the everyday interaction among uh, Colombian, Peruvian, Mexican, Puerto Rican, etc. Origin people uh, becoming neighbors, becoming friends, and sharing many things in common. Uh, Spanish, but many other many other traits. So it's a, it, there is indeed an Latino land that that you document, and, and it's it's a very important trait. Um, you were talking a little bit earlier about the geographical distribution to, of the different uh, Latino groups. So um, can you please tell us? Because a, a lot of people, I don't think, are aware of this. But can you please tell us uh, about the importance of Latin American origin? immigrants in the Washington metropolitan region, the DMV as we call it. Yes, absolutely. Um, I want to say something uh, to uh, address something that you said earlier, which is, which is important. Um, you know, the extraordinary thing about Latin Americans and the uh, Latino part of this hemisphere is that once the conquest happened, there was intermarriage. Uh, there were, uh, the mixing of races was extraordinary um, throughout the Latin American world. So, uh, so many of us are a mix of ethnicities. Uh, the, we've, we've intermarried with the, uh, the African population, the slave population that, that uh, came uh, starting in the 1500s. Um, we've intermarried with uh, the, the, the Spaniards, with the indigenous, with the Chinese, with the Japanese, with the Moorish people, the Arabs who came, um, and the, uh, the Jewish population. The, we are such a mix. I think, uh, having done my own DNA, the, um, I know that I'm a mix of ev all the things I've just mentioned uh, are very much present in me, and, and, and Bolivar, uh, as you so rightly said, um, understood this and understood that there was there, this mixing um, was actually uh, historic. It wasn't happening anywhere else in the world. This was uh, an extraordinary part of who we are, is the race mixing. And coming to the United States and being Latinos in this country, we intermarry. We are the most, uh, uh, shall we say, the, the uh, uh, the people who most intermarry with other ethnicities. Uh, there's no question about it. Um, we have uh, Latinos in the, in the Northeast that are um, very much um, a part of the African culture. We have Latinos in the West who are very much a part of the Asian culture. We have you know, a great Asian presence. Um, and so th that's really important to remember about, about us. In the metropolitan area of Washington, which you which you mention, uh, and where I'm sitting right now, uh, the um, the presence of Latinos is huge. It's it's tremendous, and um, what I'm fascinated by in the Washington area is um, the whole villages that come from different parts of the Latin world. Uh, in the book, I describe a, a village from the Colca Valley in Peru, uh, which almost came lock, stock, and barrel to Maryland and have a, um, a, a very strong community. They help each other. Uh, if somebody, if one of them, there are thousands of them. There are at least you know, 2,000, 3,000 of these uh, villagers from, 
uh, Cabana Conde, the Colca Valley of Peru. And um, anybody gets in a car accident or has a health problem, and they all get together and raise money by cooking things and selling things and sewing things. And they help each other. And they are, by now, uh, having been for three generations in Maryland, there are lawyers among them, there are doctors among them, there are people who have come from the village life uh, in the mountains, really the Sierra of Peru, to uh, create this whole uh, world that in Maryland, which is extraordinary. And they're, you know, what, 15 miles from, from Washington, D.C., from the White House, from the Capitol, uh, right here in the metropolitan area of the nation's capital. Yes, that, that's right. And also the Bolivian community has been in the DMV for a while. And as you document in the book very well, a Central American population is kind of the backbone of the construction and service industry in the Washington, D.C. area. Without them, uh, we'll be having a hard time uh, doing any renovations, buying any housing, buying any food. So uh, it's not just people tend to think about California, Texas, Florida, New York, but um, there's Latinos in many places of the of, of the country, including in large numbers in the in the DMV. Uh, so thank you, thank you for that answer. Uh, you already touched upon it, but I think it's worth revisiting. Uh, in your book, you also talk about particular individuals of African origin who come to what is now the United States territory uh, early on, e e before accompanying um, the, the pilgrims and others as, as slaves. I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about this early uh, black immigrants that are part of these Spanish explorations. Absolutely. Well, there was, you know, the very first um, Dominican who arrived in Manhattan uh, was Juan Rodriguez, who um, was a Dominican black. Um, uh, he was in the uh, employ of the Dutch, and he came with when the Dutch were in Manhattan. He he came and was, I think, the first. I call him the first bodega because he um, started to sell weapons and and guns and uh, what the Dutch needed for the fur trade because they were all out hunting. Um, raccoons and whatnot for the fur trade in the world, which is at that point what was a, a, a global market. Um, and there was Juan Rodriguez in Manhattan with his bodega of, of guns and ammunition and knives and what, whatever was needed. Um, and he was one of the first uh, Latinos in, in, uh, in this territory of the United States of America. So, um, and of course, there have been uh, an, an enormous, people forget, I think, Professor, people forget that um, in the slave trade, which was 12 million Africans from Africa who were kidnapped uh, and put on slave ships, and uh, a million of them, uh, didn't make it across the ocean, the Atlantic slave trade. Uh, people forget that only 350,000 of them went to the United States. All the other millions went to Latin America. We are a very, very um, black community, uh, Latin Americans, and, uh, and, and a mix. You know, uh, for instance, the Dominican, the Dominicans and the Puerto Ricans may not think of themselves as being black. They're, they live on, on um, their islands and they're, you know, you don't think you are a race until you get to this country. And here, where the binary is so important, where people are either black or white, um, suddenly here are the Latinos who are just every race in, of man. Um, and you don't think of yourself as black, perhaps, as you if you come here as a Dominican or a Puerto Rican, or you know someone from the Caribbean area of Venezuela or Colombia. Um, and here you're made to reckon with that. And um, and the black Americans who are here uh, consider you more black than Latino. So that's an issue of identity as well that needs to be um, reckoned with when you come to this country as an immigrant. Yes, yes. Uh, many immigrants, they become racialized into the black white binary uh, as they as they cross the border, uh, which as you explain uh, here and in the book, in Latin America, there's a, a rainbow and a mixture 
and and a lot of times people don't think in these um, in this black and white uh, binary, and, and people are Peruvian, Mexican, Colombian, and and in the U.S. there's a reshuffling of of racial and ethnic identities uh, from from within and from and from without. Uh, a little bit earlier ago in, in this conversation, you were talking about the around 36 million uh, people in the U.S. who can trace uh, their origins uh, back to Mexico. So that will be around uh, 10% of the overall U.S. population. And an interesting report, uh, a series of studies recently, were saying that uh, looking at uh, the listing of restaurants, they categorize that around 10% of all the restaurants in the United States are Mexican. So I'm using this example to say that there's a perfect representation there between the population and the number of, of restaurants. Obviously, not all the restaurants are quote unquote authentic or owned by Mexicans, but uh, the question is, can go on two ways, right? Does this show that now uh, Mexican food is as American as, as pizza or hot dogs or sushi uh, or hamburgers, all which have or apple pie, right? Which has the origin with the with the German immigrants. And now it's uh, it's becoming just a staple of, of the overall, or whether we can say that uh, uh, while Mexicans have a rich, perfect representation uh, proportionally in the food uh, choices that uh, Americans have, whether uh, we see the same representation in in Congress, in in uh, in the Library of Congress, amongst authors, uh, amongst all the jobs and the professions that that could be had. Um, whether we you think we have we have reached that parity and in Latinos overall, or whether we're still uh, underrepresented in all the different senses of the word? That is an absolutely wonderful question, Professor. It's and it gets to the heart of of representation in this country. Um, you are absolutely right. I was having a conversation with somebody at the um, Pew Research Center, which has done so much work in um, identifying us and, and, and describing us as a population uh, and as different populations, uh, who said, you know, the uh, Mexican food is now American food. There, it just is. I mean, you, you uh, a taco, a burrito, a, you know, a pupusa, all of these things are very much part of the American culture now. Um, so much apart that it's it's almost like spaghetti or something. You know, it is. It, it's American, um, and uh, and also it isn't realized. I had a Mexican say to me, you know, uh, this is a, a person who is a CEO of a corp major corporation um, in Mexico with branches in the United States. He said, if um, you know, if we pulled Mexico out of out of uh, the United States entirely, a lot of the culture uh, and a lot of the, um, the industry in the United States would collapse, absolutely collapse without the Mexican infusion that is already present. Um, proof positive is, for instance, bread. Bread in this country, the most basic food stuff. Um, most of the bread that's produced in this country is Mexican. People don't realize, you know, Wonder Bread, Arnold, Pepperidge Farm, Entenmann's, all of that is Mexican owned and Mexican produced. Um, and not to mention, of course, the agriculture in this country, the food service in this country is so dominated by um, Latinos, Hispanics, um, who work in the industry and who produce. Uh, we are the breadbasket, really, of, of the country. Um, and uh, so, that, I think, uh, alone makes us hugely um, uh, a part of the way that the country works, the way that the economy works. Uh, we represent $3.4 trillion in um, purchasing power in this country every year, which is an enormous figure. Um, it really is, and, and, and uh, I write about this as well, it is if you were to count the Latino population as a consumers and producers, we would be, the just count us as a population, we would be the fifth largest country in the world. I mean, think about that. And yet, Professor, you're so right to make the point, and yet um, we are not represented enough in the media we are not represented enough at all in Hollywood. Um, the, uh, we're not represented enough in um, universities, in the teaching profession. 
um, it, it just, the representation is not there. We are, in, and this is part of the problem of being invisible, um, that in the higher reaches of um, this country's, shall we say, management or, or where the, um, the, uh, the, the American attention is, we're not there. And yet we are so much a part of the production and the consumption in this country. Um, there are more people, uh, there are, it's, the population that attends movies is so incredibly Hispanic, Latino, and yet they're not on the screen. Um, so we have a lot of work to do in that department. Unfortunately, that that's correct, Marie. And your book is a, a contribution to to try to fix these 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 issues. Um, a quick example in the immigration lab here at American University, we just did a study where we showed that just the immigrants that send remittances abroad, which is not everybody, and it's not all Latinos because many are U.S. born, but just of the immigrants, a big number of them who are from Latin America, from the money they send home, we can we can then uh, derive that around. Uh, they are living in the U.S., they are producing for their employers over $2 trillion just in 2022. So yes, the economic impact is, is huge. The economic uh, interaction and integration of, of Mexico and U.S. Is, 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 is very hard to disentangle and growing now that uh, China has taken the, the second place uh, of, of the largest trade partner with the U.S., Mexico being one, and it's going to increase with other countries in the region. So yes, the, the, the Latino labor force uh, investment, um, brain power, etc., is, is a huge part of the uh, U.S. present. In the book, you also document very well the the, the long history and the contri historical contributions of this population, uh, and you just mentioned a lot of examples about our present. Now, in the book, you also, and I think it's important for us to discuss now, the um, the role that that Latinos will have in the in the preservation of the of the country into the future, the role that Latinos will have in, in making make, making sure that we have a U.S. future. So I wonder if you can please talk about that. Absolutely. You know, we have such a long presence in the past um, that I, I think if we understood that, we would understand uh, just in terms of numbers what we represent for the future. I think people don't realize that Latinos have participated in every war that the America has fought. I mean, we go back to the, um, the revolution. Latinos were a very, a, a very um, necessary part of the revolution. Uh, George Washington at one point said we could not have, uh, have won independence from the British had not the Spanish forces come up and helped. The, um, and there were, there were Latinos from the Caribbean all the way down to, to the mainland of, of South America that came up to fight in the, um, in the wars of independence in this country. And right up through the Civil War, right up through the, um, uh, all the, 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 world, the two world wars, the Korean War, all the way up, so that even today, there, the, the Marine Corps is 26% Latinos. So, you know, one in every four Marines is a Hispanic, is a Latino, which is an extraordinary thing that we don't realize. And um, it, it, it's not discussed, it's not talked about. Um, they, but the, the military is, uh, we are very, very present there. The, um, if you project the uh, representation that we have, not only in the military, but in, in, in uh, the country as uh, in the cities, and now more and more in the center of the country, we have, I think, traditionally occupied the periphery of the coasts, you know, of the country. Um, but now the Latino population, which moves according to the work um, that is offered in, in the country, um, is now very much a part of, of um, this heart of America, the American heartland. Uh, and I think people are realizing more and more that these are, uh, this is a community that has come into much, you know, there is, there is probably no, no state, no territory 
in, a, in the United States of America that doesn't have Latinos working and living there. Um, this is, it has tremendous, I think, implications for the future of the country. Uh, we are, if we're talking about being one in three come the year 2060, I mean, it's the population is going to grow just because we're a very young population. Uh, the average age of a Latino is in their 30s, whereas the average age of, of Anglo-Americans is in their 40s, late 40s. So um, we are a very young population. We reproduce um, large families. We are going to be here. We are part of the future. We are going to uh, make, I think, um, a lot of the, the, um, the future paths that America carves will be carved by us. Uh, and I think that's a very important uh, thing for especially those who govern us to understand um, and those who, um, you know, are counting on us to, for instance, to be a swing vote in the elections or whatever, uh, need to understand us better, need to understand that we are a diversity within a diversity. Um, and this is very important for our future, Professor, a very important point to make. Thank you. Thank you, and that's absolutely correct. There's, uh, beyond the obvious places, there's uh, Latinos working, Latino families in Alaska, in Montana, etc. As you all mentioned, Marie, the U.S. population is aging. Uh, the, for the first time in history, probably in the last few years, a popul the U.S. population has declined. And uh, in the last two years, if it wasn't for international migration, the population will keep decreasing. So uh, immigration uh, from Latin America and other places is key for the U.S. economy to keep growing. Uh, but then there's two other questions that I think are related to this that I think are important for us to discuss. One of it is the um, the feel, like what you said is correct, that we are the future, we're here, we're a growing numbers, um, uh, the youth population is, is Latino, but that doesn't mean that, uh, quote unquote, as some people say, there's a great replacement or a conspiracy theory to change America. Uh, U.S. born Latinos speak Spanish like natives. U.S. US Latinos keep American culture, institutions, politics alive. So I think it's, it's something that, that I would like you to, to talk a little bit more about the, the, the quick assimilation, integration, uh, Americanization of, of, of Latinos and how they become the, the, the backbone of, of the country like other immigrant groups have in the past. So that on one hand, and in the other hand, as you were saying, the, the pounding from different groups that keep equating uh, Latinos in the US as immigrants, first of all, which is, which is not true, over half of the population have been uh, born in the US and have been here for many generations, as you well say. Um, but also this uh, unfortunate discourse by some politicians and, and some media outlets that equate being Latino or being Hispanic to being uh, undocumented or even worse, illegal, right? Less than, less than a person, uh, being, being a defective, morally defective uh, population. So uh, how, what can you say that about this, this invisibility and exclusion by this recurrent trope of Latinos as newcomers, as you say, as immigrants? and therefore it's illegal and how that and against the history you talk about and also puts our future in peril. What, what, what will be your, your message to, 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 to us about that? Very important, very important message. Uh, the, uh, the trope that we are all immigrants is just simply false. And this, the, my book, if it does anything, um, I hope it dispels this notion uh, because the, uh, the uh, Hispanic population has been here, as I say very clearly, since the 1500s. It's completely documentable. Um, it is, a lot of it is neglected. I mean, people don't realize that the first admiral of the Navy, of the U.S. Navy, was um, David Farragut. And his, his name was Jaime Farragut, and he was a Latino. And this was the first uh, admiral. You know, the, the, the entrenchment of Latinos sometimes is hidden, and we don't, we don't necessarily see it because it has been here for so long. It has been such a part of our presence um, uh, as Americans. And I think that Latinos are, as I've just talked about being uh, volunteering for the, for the military, very strong sense of pride in being Americans uh, and, and in participating in that culture. Uh, the, that notion of replacement 
um, is patently uh, sort of ridiculous because uh, it, it, we've been here. We've been here for a very long time. Um, we are not replacing anybody. We are uh, we are growing as any aspect of the population would, um, as the German Americans, the Irish Americans, the Anglo Americans have grown in their populations. Ours are commensurately growing with our numbers. Uh, and I think that the, um, the important thing to remember here is that the, um, as you say, the, uh, the population is so necessary and so important to the working of the nation, to the, uh, the, the productivity of the nation. Um, and uh, that, when you are a part, when you are a mechanism, you are, you're a working part of uh, the community of Americans in this country, um, there, the, the sense of, of loyalty uh, that we bring to this country is very often neglected and very much there. Um, I, have you, if you've ever watched uh, the, uh, the citizenship ceremonies of newly uh, arrived immigrants, um, it's, it's extraordinarily moving, which I have seen many times now. The, um, the, the sense that you are here, you are here to work, you are here to contribute, you are here to be part of, of the American community and be a part of the American story going forward. Um, uh, I like to keep my eye on that. Thank you, Marie. Uh, and the last question before we grab, wrap up, uh, can you tell us uh, briefly about what are some of the risks that, uh, that we face as a society when uh, some politicians from either party uh, uh, portrait uh, Latinos, uh, new immigrants from Latin America and the Caribbean as unwelcome, as invaders, as interlopers, uh, what is what is the risk to creating violence, to excluding people that are well established in the U.S.? And what are the um, some people think that they may be uh, having electoral benefits, although the data shows that that is not the case. They are alienating a lot of other voters, and 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 most Americans are pro-immigration, unlike politicians. So, what will be your your since we are in 2024 and uh, electoral year? What will be your 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 advice to people uh, running campaigns in these coming months? Uh, very very interesting because and I've just uh, had a piece that is appearing in the Washington Post this week uh, about this very subject, Professor. Um, the assumption I think on the part of the Democratic Party that because um, the assumption that we are all poor, the assumption that we are all helpless, that we are all new. Uh, and that we are uh, in need of welfare, which is, uh, even for the undocumented, uh, it is not true. The, uh, the, uh, the undocumented are actually, uh, who are here, uh, who are Latinos, um, are, are, are actually not a burden on the government. They pay taxes, they own homes, they, um, even, even being undocumented doesn't mean you are, um, you know, taking from the U.S. government, uh, not at all, and people have that misconception. Um, but the the uh, assumption on the part of the Democratic Party, and this is this is uh, this is something that the, the Democratic Party has to work on if it wants to keep its hold on Latinos, um, is that um, we are naturally um, uh, Democrats because we will we want government, we want um, help, uh, all of which is less and less true. The Republican Party has been very, very successful in uh, recruiting, uh, particularly in the Southwest, um, particularly in the South, the whole uh, swath of the South of, of, of this country. Um, has ha had a lot of success with Republicans. There has been also a great wave of, um, uh, of Latinos moving into the evangelical uh, community. They have, um, uh, there has been, a, a, I think, a, a great sort of exodus from Catholicism into the uh, evangelical churches, the mega churches. Um, and those mega churches are largely, of course, Republicans, they're conservative. Um, and so the the assumption that we are going to vote anyway um, is 
a, a false assumption because this is a very diverse, politically diverse uh, population. It, uh, de it changes. Uh, my parents, my father, when he came to this country, was a Republican. And with time, the whole, you know, the, uh, at, at the end of my mother's life, she was voting for Barack Obama. So, you know, it's a very fluid population. Uh, we're likely to be more independents, really, in terms of the mindset uh, than we are any party. Um, we come from countries where the words conservative and liberal mean very different things. Uh, a, a, a liberal in, in some of our countries means um, you know, communist, uh, a communist country, and there are people who have allergies to communism, as the Cubans do, because of the Castro Revolution. Um, and so they are Republicans for that reason, or they tend to be Republicans for that reason. But, um, you know, people don't often think of the trajectories of the Latino population or the fact that just in the way that we cannot be categorized is in the binary of black and white, we can't be really categorized in, in terms of um, our politics as well. It's likely to shift. It's a very fluid situation. Thank you, thank you. And as you say in your book, the, um, the Latinos, rather than being concerned about uh, elites or uh, highly sophisticated uh, policy debates, they are interested in well-paying jobs, in access to education, in, in basic uh, um, uh, w well being like any other American. So that's something that sometimes escapes some of the some of the parties. Um, so uh, thank you very much, Marie, for uh, answering my questions and engaging in this uh, enlightening conversation. Uh, the book again is Latino Land, uh, just coming out this 2024. Uh, it's a fantastic read. It's full of, um, we learn a lot about Marie and her family, uh, a lot of uh, personal uh, stories, anecdotes, uh, a lot of the conversations she had with the over 230 interviews she, she did for this uh, book, uh, beyond all the sources and the books and other materials that she consulted. So very well researched book, very well written book, very accessible, and very important to learn more about our US society, which in, in part is uh, it's, it's inhabited by, by this uh, Latino community who are part of, of, of us, the United States of America. So uh, congratulations, Marie, on, the, on this great accomplishment. I look forward to continuing the conversation um, in the future. Thank you very much, Professor. It's such a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Likewise. Thanks for listening to this week's Afterwards podcast. If you are interested in podcasts about nonfiction books, listen to C-SPAN's Book Notes Plus podcast for interviews with authors and historians hosted by Brian Lamb.